You're listening to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we'll be talking to Claude Goldenberg about the science of reading research and multilingual learners. We want to know what the research says about how to best support English learners. He helps us understand that anyone learning to read, including multilingual learners, needs to connect phonemes to graphemes to semantics or bind sound to symbol to meaning. Let's jump in. Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy. Today, we are talking about the science of reading and multilingual learners. We have a great guest today here with us, Claude Goldenberg, who we've heard on several other podcasts and we loved listening to him. And he is a professor emeritus of education at Stanford University. So welcome, Claude. We're excited to have you. Thanks. Thanks to you both. I'm delighted to be here. Yeah. Well, before we like dive in, dive in, really go deep today, can we talk about what language we should use during this conversation? We know there are lots of different terms. There's English learners, emergent bilinguals, multilingual learners. It's hard to keep up as things change. So we figured we'd ask you, the expert, to help us clarify that before we even launched into the conversation with you today. Right. Well, you know, it's a good place to start because, um, as someone once said, I can't remember who, language is a great thing, but not so good for communication. <laughs> and it, it's a good example because the labels have changed. You know, they used to be ESL kids, uh, bilingual kids, uh, limited English proficient, uh, non English proficient. And then it became English learners, which is a more, a more sort of a positive. More recently, emergent bilinguals has become popular. Multilingual learners has become popular. Uh, in the legislation, up until recently, it was limited English proficient, you know, LEP. And then it became English learner. Um, when I write, I normally say, I go, English learners, emergent bilinguals, multilingual learners. <laughs> ELs, EBs, MLLs, for short. <laughs> oh, so you, so, do you use it all? <laughs> Can you use it? All? So, is, it is one? Well, is there, I, are any it, wrong? No, you know, okay. it's, I mean, it, it a little bit, you know, depends on the term of art that you prefer. Mm. Um, you know, they're, they're all sort of slightly and nuancedly, if you can make nuance into an adverb, <laughs> different, but they, they refer essentially the same group of kids, you know, right. kids who come from homes where a, a language other than English is spoken, and they are not yet sufficiently proficient in English to be able to take full advantage of mainstream uh, stock and trade English instruction. I mean, that, that, that's what it means. And, and by law, uh, Supreme Court decisions and various other things, you have to make some kind of adjustments or accommodations to support their access to academic content. And it, it can be bilingual education. It doesn't need to be. I mean, we can talk about that. I mean, that's in, in many ways the, the preferred way to go, but it can be what's called sometimes sheltered instruction. Uh, it's any way that, that, that you can make the content of instruction accessible to them, that's the requirement. And at the same time, promote English language development. So they need direct teaching, instruction, opportunities to develop their English language proficiency. And until they reach some criterion level of English proficiency, the law requires that we do something to protect their civil rights, protect their educational rights. And what we call them is what we call them, but it refers to the same construct, the same concept, the same set of ideas. So whatever that term... Was yeah. that sufficiently long-winded for you? <laughs> so whatever term I use, you'll know what I mean, right? <laughs> I do. Yes, I think, we, I think we've established that here. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> All right. So then to jump on in, um, you know, we've been talking this summer about the science of reading, and that term has a lot of layers to it. Um, right. 
But specifically, we wanted to talk to you because there seems to be um, some noise and conversation about how that term does not apply to multilingual learners that shouldn't shouldn't even be in the conversation. Um, and that felt really confusing to me and Lori. Like, why would that be? And we don't feel like we know enough about it. So we wanted to pick your brain. But we also know during the pre-call, you mentioned some foundational concepts of language and reading that would be really helpful for our listeners to hear before we even get into that <laughs> debate. So do you want to start there? Okay, well, you asked for it. So, you know, <laughs> so here goes. So, I mean, let me start by saying, I mean, I, I the con, the term science of reading, you know, I mean, I want, again, make a distinction between the ter- the concept, you know, the, the thing mm-hmm. we're talking about and then the language and the terms that we use to talk about that thing, right? And, and they're two different things. <laughs> so yeah. the science of reading, the concept refers to, you know, a large body of research that's accumulated over the past, I don't know, at least half century, you know, if not more. Uh, some people would say it goes back to 1908, famous book by Huey, which began the scientific study of reading, right? So depending on how long your historical perspective is, it's either been around half a century or a century and a quarter. So even that's kind of like fuzzy. So the idea is research, which comes in many stripes, persuasions, colors, hues, um, research intended to help us understand how learners, I mean, usually children, but not necessarily just, because a lot of times, you know, adults haven't learned to read and they need, need to want to learn to read later in life. But but research that helps us understand how learners learn to become literate, you know, to, to be able to read and write. Um, what needs to happen inside their brains, what needs to happen outside their brains in the form of instruction in the form of experiences, in the form of, you know, environment and socialization and all those experiences that contribute to our learning, growth, and development. So the science of reading, in scare quotes, refers to the knowledge that's been accumulated about what needs to happen in order for people to become literate. Again, what needs to happen in the brain, right, intrinsic to the human being, human, and then what hap- what kind of experiences they need to have now unfortunately the term science of reading has become it's become fraught you know it's become like a lightning rod you know uh, a a buzzword that gets kind of thrown around and i'm afraid with sometimes extremely superficial understanding of what it is we're actually talking about you know, in research, one of the things they tell you to do in PhD school when you write your dissertation is to define your terms. And and that's probably a good idea because, like I said, there's the thing itself and then there's language that we use to talk, talk about the thing. And if you don't define your terms, you end up talking past each other. And that's precisely what happens in a lot of conversations around the science of reading. And it comes from both sides, those who are presumably advocates of science of reading and those who are skeptics of the science of reading. And there are plenty on both sides. So I like to, instead of thinking about the science of reading, I like to think, you know, what is the best knowledge that we have that helps us, guides us, uh, promote literacy for, for as many people as possible, whether English learners or monolingual English speakers or trilinguals or kids who have difficulty getting traction learning to read? What's the best knowledge that we can draw on? And sometimes this best knowledge comes from experiments, for sure. But not only. I mean, there's some really good observational studies that have been done that have tried to understand in a more kind of minute sort of way. There are studies that have been done that can't be done experimentally because there's certain things that just cannot be manipulated experimentally. And, you know, we can get into these if you're interested. But there are all sorts of studies that can inform us as to what is the likeliest way to promote literacy for as many people as possible. One of the mistakes people make about when they talk about science of reading or science of anything is they assume that science means certainty. And science doesn't mean certainty. Science is really more of a sort of probabilistic enterprise. You know, when, I mean, we have a a very good example from the recent pandemic. I mean, no one who, who is informed about the science could possibly say the vaccines prevent all instances of COVID. 
we talk in terms of probabilities. You know, you say if you get the vaccine, certain kind of vaccines, you, your chances of getting COVID are reduced substantially by 90%. Some, they're reduced by 70%. Some uh, cures that were touted by politicians who we don't need to name at the moment because we're not talking politics, <laughs> had no effect whatsoever on the probabilities. Might as well flip a coin. Some had negative effects. So we, you have to remember we're talking about probabilities. We're not talking about absolute certainty. So when anyone talks about certainty, you know, science has proven this and that, you got to be a little skeptical. It is really more about probabilities than it is absolute certainty. Now, over a large population, you can't talk about certainty. There's a certain amount of certainty that if everyone gets vaccinated, the incidence of a of a disease, COVID, smallpox, whatever, goes down dramatically. But that's at a population level, not for any particular individual. Okay, enough philosophy of, of science, <laughs> just to kind of clarify some of the, the reasons for skepticism. Okay. I mean, I, I want to emphasize that. Skepticism is a part of science. You know, if people are skeptical about this or that, that's what drives science forward. But I want to distinguish between informed skepticism where you know the research or the statistics or the findings, and, and there are areas where there's reason for skepticism, and uninformed, sometimes called ignorant skepticism, which is not a good thing. That never propels understanding because you're being skeptical about something you don't fully understand, and you really don't have a right to be skeptical about. So anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Back to science of reading, or whatever we call it, scare quotes or not, <laughs> and multilingual learners. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the tremendous pieces of misinformation that has been spread recently, uh, to my dismay, is when people claim that the science of reading, the best knowledge about teaching literacy, whatever you want to call it, doesn't apply to English learners. And honestly, anyone who says that doesn't really know the full scope of the research. Because while it is true that a lot of the research, probably most, has been done with monolingual speakers, and not just monolingual English speakers. There's a worldwide literature from Europe, from Asia, you know, different countries in Africa, different continents. So there's a worldwide literature. People have been investigating reading and literacy for a long time and worldwide. But a lot of that research, if not most, is with monolingual speakers. And not just monolingual English speakers, but a lot is with monolingual English speakers. But there's a considerable amount of research that's directly relevant to English learners. Some of that is done, has been done here in the United States with English learners or emergent bilinguals. A couple of really key studies by Sharon Vaughn, one by Linnea Airy. We can get the details if you want, that directly relate to the questions that people ask about best practices for teaching reading to English learners. Uh, there's a lot of research on in bilingual education, uh, and we can get into that. And one of the problems we have is people don't make the distinction between English learners who are learning to read in English, meaning they're simultaneously learning the language as they're learning to become literate in the language, which presents some pretty obvious and not so obvious challenges. And then English learners who are in a bilingual program where they're learning to read in a language they already know, which is a very different situation and requires, you know, thinking about it differently. There's a lot of overlap, but you got to make that distinction. But there's also a worldwide literature on second language learners. Um, one uh, group of articles that I, I found really tremendously helpful is uh, in a few uh, a couple of years ago, there was an issue of the Journal of Neurolinguistics specifically devoted to learning to read in your L2, in your second language, in a language you are simultaneously learning. So there's research there at the neuronal, at the brain level, that is also informative. And it just just puzzles me. I could use another word, but it just puzzles me when people say the research on the science of reading is all with monolingual English speakers, when it's just not true. And it's really very dangerous, I think, because you're basically saying there's a whole bunch of research that is relevant, could inform us, but it doesn't matter. Science of reading, you can discount it because it's all about monolingual English speakers. I think people who advocate say that are doing a tremendous disservice to the field. I mean, certainly the English learners and their, and, their, and their teachers, but their families and the population as a whole. So it's something I find just tremendously disturbing. If there's 
One thing that I would wish to come from this conversation is that we could dispel that mythology because it, it's not doing anybody any good except, I don't know, people who might have some intellectual investment in assuming, propounding that the science of reading is only about English speakers, English monolingual speakers. Does that answer your question, Melissa, or did I just beat a dead horse again? It's <laughs> definitely not. Uh, well, definitely not beat a dead horse. Um, but I think we have a lot of follow up questions for you from it. <laughs> Go. Yeah. The one that I'm thinking about, Claude, is, you know, I'm thinking about all of the parallels that every time I read uh, literature that is, I, I put this in quotes, like so, spo- supposed to be specific to multilingual learners. There's so many parallels for me where I'm like, oh, that's reminds me very much of what I read for monolingual learners. It's the same strategies. I mean, with maybe some additional ones, but it is not quote to me, at least anything new. And I think that really rang true in our conversation. Uh, We had, I think it was last summer with Elsa Cardenas Hagen. She wrote a beautiful book and I remember reading it and just highlighting and just, I was like, every time you know, you see something that seems familiar, put a star. And the whole page was filled, the whole chapter that I was reading was filled with stars. Just, okay, this seems very familiar for, that I've read before for monolingual learners. And I I just feel like there are so many parallels. One of the things you said in our pre-call, and I'd love for you to, to talk a little bit more about it, is that idea that the structure of the brain, of every brain really is the same, right? It's, It's the functional difference. We're asking the brain to function differently to learn a second language, not like restructure itself per se. Um, And so I think what what you kind of if you could talk about that a little bit and then also talking about as you talk about uh, that connecting the parts, I think you mentioned like um, phonemes and graphemes, orthography and semantics. I think that might be really helpful to contextualize this conversation. Yeah, yeah, great. No, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Well, first of all, full disclosure, I believe in full disclosure, I'm not a neuroscientist, as I think I mentioned. I don't know the difference between my earlobe, my prefrontal lobe. (laughs) One's inside my head and one I can see. I'm glad we're all on the same page with that because I'm right right there with you. That's about (laughs) where I am. Yeah. Great, great. We have have beautiful convergence here. (laughs) But but I've read some of that stuff, at least the, the stuff that I can understand, like in the Journal of Neurolinguistics. Yeah. I mean, there's some really key articles. And I've had some discussions with uh, neuroscientists. Um, uh, Kenneth Pugh, for example, who is a very prominent neuroscientist and has done uh, some of the work that's featured in uh, th- that particular journal. He, he co-edited, actually. And so here, here's another myth that I would like to dispel. You know, there's something called a bilingual brain that requires that we teach literacy in a fundamentally different way. Okay, now I want to be careful here because it's it's kind of complicated and nuanced. And like I said, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm trying to channel the parts that I understand without doing <laughs> violence to their, to their findings. Right. Uh, you know, in one sense, you can say there's a bilingual brain, right? I'm bilingual. I have a brain. Ergo ipso facto, as the logicians like to say, there is a bilingual brain. You know, it's clanging around in my head. <laughs> and, and there's evidence that, that there are some functional differences. There, there's some switching that goes on. There's some known advantages to bilingualism, some metacognitive strategies, some kind of sort of phil- more philosophical things like bilinguals seem to understand earlier that there's a difference between a thing and the name for the thing. Because mm-hmm. if you're bilingual, you know two alternative names for the same thing. So, ah, there might be a difference between the, you know. You, so there are those kinds of things, you know, metacognition. Uh, there's some evidence, Ellen Bialystok, some years ago, you might have heard of her. She's a prominent bilingual researcher. Not so much bilingual education, but bilingual from a psychological standpoint. There's some evidence that uh, bilinguals, uh, bilinguals have delayed onset to Alzheimer's. And if they do get Alzheimer's, it's that severe. So a lot of really intriguing and important uh, differences as a function of being bilingual. But from my understanding, these these sort of linguistic, psychological uh, kind of differences don't then mean that 
that if you're bilingual, you have to be taught to read in a different way. Because the the fun the, the essential parts of literacy involve, as we were talking about yesterday, Lori, connecting the, the, the sounds of the language, the, the phonology, to the written representations of the language, the language spelling system, the orthography, and then binding those and then connecting them with the semantics, the meaning system of the language. That's the brain circuitry that needs to be created in order to enable literacy, both reading and writing. Now, we're born knowing how to process oral language. I mean, it's just yeah. it's just part of our part of our evolutionary makeup. You know, there are different theories as to whether language was an evolution evolved for communication purposes or evolved for cognitive purposes. I'm definitely not qualified to enter into that, but just know that there are a lot of questions about language, its role in human evolution, and you might have a, want, want to have an interesting conversation with someone who's knowledgeable about that <laughs> uh, at some point in the future, because it's, it's truly fascinating. But the fact is that human speech, oral language, has been around for, I don't know, 300,000 years, give or take 10 or 20,000 years. But writing, print, the representation of concepts that you can say, representing them in a graphical written form, that's a recent development. That's a recent invention. It's a human invention. It's been around 5,000 years. And alphabetic languages have been around even uh, a shorter amount of time, about 3,500 years. So while we're born with the brain capacity to become literate, again, absent any developmental delay or, or anomalies, the circuitry that connects the sound, the symbol, and the meaning has got to be constructed. It's not there at birth, mm -hmm. as is the ability to make sense of human speech. In fact, as I think I mentioned, I mean, it's been demonstrated that human newborns orient to human speech. I mean, much more so than anything else, oh. to the extent that they start orienting. And that's probably an evolutionary adaptation, right? If you orient to human speech, you're going to be orienting to your human caretakers and so on and so forth. But there's nothing comparable to that. They're not going to orient to print. Print is intrinsically meaningless unless you make those connections that the brain circuitry requires. And that brain, brain circuitry emerges mostly by being taught. Now, a lot of kids learn to read in what seem to be a kind of very natural way that's analogous to learning to speak. But that analogy between learning to speak and understand oral language and learning to read and write printed language is a very, it's a bad one. It's a bad analogy for the reasons that I just said. You're born being able to process, having the mental equipment to process and then produce speech or a language. You're not born with that capability to be able to make sense of and produce printed speech. And just think about it, you know, printed language comes into you, is perceived visually, and then is processed in the brain differently than oral language, which comes in through your ears, just above my earlobe here, <laughs> <laughs> and then is processed differently. So, so they're both language, oral language and written language are both language and they're highly related. I mean, the correlations between, you know, your oral vocabulary and written vocabulary and written production and, and oral, there's significant correlations, but they're not the same thing. They're, they're distinct. They're perceived and processed in the brain differently enough that we need to be aware of their being acquired in different sorts of ways. Now, with that as a prelude, when you learn to read, you got to make that same sort of connection, whether you're learning in a language you know or learning in a language you don't know. The difference is that if you're learning in a language, you're learning to read in a language you don't know, you need to be provided additional support to support the semantic connection and to some extent also the phonological connection, because when you're learning a second language, part of what you're learning is are the sounds of the language. Now, in the case of a language like, language like English and Spanish, there's a lot of overlap. 
There's a lot of right. what they call transfer because all the consonants are basically the same. The vowels, you know, wreak havoc on reading. <laughs> if you know the language, and especially if you don't know the language, because in Spanish, there are five vowel sounds, one per vowel. In English, there are, depending on how you count, I don't know, 15, 20 different <laughs> vowel sounds, long, short, umlaut, whatever. So you need the support of, to understand uh, and be able to perceive and process the phonology of the second language and the semantics, the, the meanings of the words of the second language. So you need that additional support. I mean, if you think about it from a, like a common sense standpoint, I, I always find it dangerous to talk about common sense because common sense usually means what I already believe. But let's assume common sense is actually common sense. When you're, when you're an English speaker and learning to read, the words that are being used to teach you to read are usually very familiar. If you're five, six, seven years old, you know the words that are being taught to te teach you to read. Cat, bat, run, see, right? These are known words. They're, the semantics of the words are no puzzle to you, no mystery. If you're learning the language, you're an English learner, you can't assume that those words are already meaningful to the learner. So what happens? You can teach someone to connect the phonology with the orthography to basically memorize it. But until you can bind that to the semantics, you can't really, you can't do what, what's called orthographic mapping, a, 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 a term coined, and I'm sure is familiar to your listeners, by Linnea Airy, which describes how individuals, as they start to read, develop a grow, an ever-growing bank of sight words. So sight words used to be words that are so phonetically irregular, you had to learn them sort of by sight, like as a big blob, because you can't decode them. Well, there's a new twist on sight words. Sight words are words that you can read instantly by sight. You don't have to decode them, right? So you want to get to the point where an individual can see a word like bat or see or any of those decodable words, but they're not decoding them. Because they've they've been orthographically mapped, the phonology, the orthography, and the semantics have been bound together, and they are sight words. Now you still have the capability when you come to a word that you've not seen before to decode it. You absolutely need that, but after a few times seeing it, that becomes a sight word too. And that's how reading proficiency grows by growing your bank of sight words. That same process has ha has to happen with English learners. But instructionally, and the brain science supports this, as far as I can tell from everything I've read, you need additional support in the phonology of the second language and the semantics, the word meanings of the second language, because those don't already exist. For English speakers, those already exist for the words that you're, by and large, well, there are some exceptions. I mean, kids have greater and smaller vocabularies. That's known. But by and large, absent some anomaly. If you speak the language in which you're learning to read, those words exist in your vocabulary. Again, by and large, this is generalization. And what you need to do is bind the sound and the spelling to that existing semantic understanding. English learners need additional support for that to happen. And the studies by Vaughn and Airy that I mentioned really demonstrate that in a very clear and compelling way. Now, notice I said demonstrate and not prove, because not everybody in those interventions learned to read. But they did so at a significantly and meaningfully greater rate than kids in the control condition, where that kind of additional support, along with phonology, orthography, you know, the the, the buzz, the things in science of reading, phonemic awareness, letter sound associations, all those things come together with additional support for learning the second language as you're learning to read the second language. So that's the kind of Lori. If I could say, so that's the kind of commonality, Lori, that you were referring to. There are a lot of commonalities, a absolutely, but there's additional supports needed because, by definition, you're learning to read in a language you're learning to understand and speak. Sorry, Melissa, I just wanted oh, no, to put no, a point on that. <laughs> yes. I was just going to ask about those studies. So I, I don't know if you want to talk any more about them than what you just said. Um, if not, that's okay. But I was curious about those studies, so I wanted yeah. to learn more. No, no, that's no, that's great. No, I, I, I'd be happy to. But And again, 
I mean, it, it illustrates the point that Lori brought up, which right. I, I just I can't say too many times. And that is that you have a common, let's just say there's a, let me put it this way. The foundation of effective instruction for ELs is effective instruction, right. period. Uh, there's, there's been a, there've been studies that have demonstrated this. There was a research review done some years ago by the late, great Bob Slavin, where he reviewed all the studies done with English learners in literacy. And he concluded that the most effective programs were the ones that began as effective programs for English speakers, right? Where the language per se was not an issue. And then there were adjustments made to make them accessible and productive for English learners. Now, he he drew that conclusion, that generalization, before the Arian Vaughn studies were done. And the Arian Vaughn studies, I mean, just, just nailed it. Because what each did, slightly different, but the same idea, they each began with early interventions for kids who were having difficulty getting traction in reading. You know, kids we call at risk. They were in kindergarten, first grade. They were, you know, weak on phonological skills, letter names, um, so on and so forth. Had trouble reading, had trouble getting started. Now, these kids were not necessarily dyslexic because you can't diagnose dyslexia in kindergarten. You can't diagnose dyslexia in the absence of systematic instruction and see how they respond to it. So the idea of identifying kids who are at risk is to prevent the onset of dyslexia, or at least to mitigate its its seriousness. So in both cases, they had kids. In, in Sharon's study, they were identified English learners. In Linnea's study, they were emergent bilinguals. Here's an interesting point back to your first question, Melissa, what do we call these kids? <laughs> in in the Linnea Airy study, the kids were technically not identified as English learners. Now, I don't know why, but there is a lot of variability in the identification of English learners around the country. The criteria should be consistent, but they're not. Different measures are used. Different districts apply the label more or less rigorously and scrupulously. So there are lots of reasons why some kids who seem to be like they're English learners are not technically English learners. But for sure, the kids in the area study were emergent bilinguals because they were all kids from Spanish-speaking homes. And Spanish was not, English was not their first language. And while they weren't considered English learners, they were probably not really fluent in English, I'm, I'm inferring a lot of things here just from the demographic descriptions of the kids. So if you here's an, here's a reason it's good to go say E L E B, because if I go E L E B, <laughs> both studies fall in that broader category. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's <laughs> yeah. convenient from that standpoint. But there's no doubt in my mind that these are kids who are not really proficient in English, or at least not as proficient as native English speaking kids who grow up speaking English, and at the same time. They were having trouble learning to read, having trouble getting traction on some of those foundational basic skills. So what Sharon and Linnea did in each in their own study was they began with an early inter intervention that they had used for years with uh, English monolingual speakers and had, you know, good, good effects, good, good results. And these were... Uh, interventions that had kind of the usual, you know, the five pillars that we know from the National Reading Panel, uh, phonemic awareness, letter sounds, fluency, vocabulary, and something else. Oh, comprehension. Comprehension. <laughs> Don't forget comprehension. It's pretty important. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Whoops. So they, had, so they had those five components, and they had monolingual English speakers, and they gave them a very, you know, systematic, structured literacy direct instruction, lots of practice and feedback. Nothing surprising. I mean, it came right out of the national reading panel, or at least, you know, that part of it that focused on those things. And they got good, significant, meaningful results. So they took those interventions. I think Linnaeus was called reading, what was it? Not reading recovery, but it was reading uh, something that people find offensive because it's, oh, reading rescue. I remember I've talked to a couple of people, particularly English learner advocates who find it offensive to call it reading rescue because it's like, oh, these poor children have to be, be rescued. rescued. Yeah. You know, words trip us up, right? I mean, yeah. okay, fine. Find find a more empowering 
label. But let's go I also with the think concept. there's something about the yeah the with the R and the R. I mean, I I think it goes back to that quote bilingual brain. It's catchy, you know. We got we, <laughs> alliteration. We got the yeah the alliteration. <laughs> alliteration, right? That's that's right. Anyway, catchy, I'm not but... saying it's all right, but you know, the lexicon. No, that, that's a very good phonological point. <laughs> but from a rhetorical standpoint, it's got its problems. <laughs> For real. Yeah. But my point would be, okay, get over it, right? It's it's a bad that's name, but think it, about what yeah. they're doing, the concept, you know, what they're trying to do. And then, and then Sharon's study was one they developed called Proactive. In Spanish, it's Proactiva. In English, it's Proactive. And that's a little more, shall we say, ennobling. Yes. <laughs> okay, but let's get over the labels, okay? <laughs> I, I was going to say, that, running... that, one, that one sounds like a yogurt to me. I think that's a yogurt that sounds, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because it's loaded with probiotics, right? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh boy, we are connecting dots <laughs> like nobody's business. Okay. Lots, and of, of, course lots reading, of schema. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever that is, lots of it. Yeah. Anyway, so they began with these programs that were of demonstrated effectiveness with English speakers, and they added a uh, English language development component. Right? Where they where they taught the meanings of, most important, they taught the meanings of the words the kids were being taught to read. Uh, they taught them the instructions for the activities, um, draw, you know, just just functional words that you need to understand when you're being given directions to do something. L Linnea's study I found particularly intriguing um, because she has a passage where she talks about what the intent of the intervention was. Because what they did was they not only taught the kids the, the meanings of the words, but they would like read with them the when they started reading words and started reading like little sentences and little storybooks, you know, that were, you know, decodable things. I mean, things to practice their decoding skills. Um, and she described how they would talk about the words, the meanings of the words, that the students were asked to uh, retell the stories, even though these are very little simple stories. It could have been like, you know, two or three sentences. But but something was happening, and they asked the kids to retell the story in in their own words, you know, using the English they could and as haltingly as as they could. And the, so the kids were expected to answer questions about the story, and then be able to to some degree retell the story. In other words, use the words in discourse, in actual functional communicative discourse. So it wasn't just doing vocabulary lessons, although they did that. But it was also words in context, so they understood the words, which just is, was a beautiful illustration of providing the additional support that's needed in learning to read words when you're learning the language and the meaning of the words. And she has this beautiful sentence where she says, the intent of the intervention was to encourage the kids to read the words decode the words using their phonic skills and then confirm confirm the word using meaning and context even pictures now this is a very important point because you know the big hoo-ha is about <laughs> balanced literacy three pictures queuing. three queuing <laughs> ding 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 exactly and, and before anyone gets triggered <laughs> They're going to say, we're not listening to Claude. He brought up pictures. <laughs> That's right. Uh, it was It's all on me. <laughs> let, let me make this very important distinction, because the intent of the intervention was to have kids make their first pass at recognizing a word to be using their decoding skills, their phonic skills, letter sound association, how those combine to form a word. And once you say the word, then you think, is that a word I recognize? And then you think, does it make sense here? Now, in balanced literacy, as you know, there's not this, let's just call it a word recognition protocol. In balanced literacy, it's, it's not balanced, it's kind of random. You know, you look at a word, if you don't know it, well, what would make sense here? Well, look at the first letter. Well, look at the picture. Well, what do you think would would be a good word well, to put here. Take a guess. Yeah, take a guess. <laughs> take a guess. The, 
infamous G word, right? All the way back to Ken Goodman's psycholinguistic guessing game. Now, a lot of balanced literacy people want to disavow the guessing part. Okay, but, you know, you find it in the materials. I know Lucy Calkins and her group tried to excise all that stuff, but, you know, the manuals that I read had have guessing in it. And it's it's buried so deeply in balanced literacy DNA, if I can use a very unscientific analogy. <laughs> it's buried so deeply that it ends up functionally being guessing. Because how what which cue do you use first? First letter, the picture, the context, what makes sense, syntax. I mean, it's like random. It's a, it's just a very poor way to teach reading because we know from other research and other things, not just Linnea and Sharon's study, that, that the most reliable way to begin to recognize a word is by using your decoding skills. That's Now, let me make a distinction between decoding and word recognition. They're not the same thing. And Linnea's statement illustrates that. Word recognition, notice recognition has cogni- something about cognition in it, recognition, recognize. To rec- recognize something, you have to have already known it. Word recognition means, aha, that's a word. Now, the, f- the best on-ramp to word recognition is decoding, because that's the most reliable way. Is it perfect? No. That's why you need to know the meanings of the words. But the first pass has got to be using your decoding skills. First letter, second letter, third. Use your letter sound knowledge and your knowledge, which gets increasingly complicated, that a letter sounds different depending on the letters that's before it and after it and all these all those things. But use your decoding skills to begin to recognize a word. And then you've recognized it when you say, yeah, that's a word I know. And okay, yeah, it makes sense there. That kind of metacognitive process is part of orthographic mapping. And for English learners, if they don't know the word before they have to recognize it, well, you can see what a chasing your tail activity that is. You can't recognize it if you've never seen it before, if you don't know what it means. (laughs) And you certainly can't judge whether it makes sense in context. And I was going to say, they probably know, like, I'm just thinking of the word cat, for instance. I'm sure they know what a cat is, right? So they know, but not in English, (laughs) right? They they don't know the English word for cat. So all they need to know is that connection of, this is the English word for something you probably already know. (laughs) That's right. A lot of, again, that's exactly right. Because a lot of these concepts, you know, are, are not... Well, some concepts are difficult, even though words are easy. That, that's right. true. Sure. But a lot of these concepts are known by them, but they just don't know the English label for them. And so you can't do re- word recognition right. if you don't recognize that as a word that you know. Right. And you can't judge whether it makes sense in context if you don't understand the larger context. And all of that requires, all of that requires that you, you know the language, you know the words that you're being taught to read and the text that you're being taught to read. So that that's the, the fundamental distinction. But it in no way indicates that you've got like a different brain that's got to be treated differently. The same brain needs additional support for the reasons that I that I mentioned. And to try to completely wipe off the face of the map the relevance of science of reading for English learners, because there's some presumed difference that makes all that irrelevant. Again, I think is it just a terrible disservice to the field? Yeah, that's such a good point. I I often think that it's the uh, default is to think of those students coming in with like as a blank slate versus mm-hmm. kind mm-hmm. of what you just said, Melissa. Like, you know, our students have so much knowledge and and often know so much that they just struggle to communicate in the language that we understand, but in the language that they know, they have so much. It's just kind of invisible or harder to see and yes. making those connections very visual and explicit for them is really helpful. So I just, I appreciate this conversation so much. Um, it's also making me think about why I probably did not learn my uh, second language in high school so well, because I re- just remember at nauseum conjugating verbs, which wasn't super helpful to me, you know? Um, 
And <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to say about the way we'll learn it, the, the way that we do this to uh, to kids that might be ineffective. But and naming some of those things, Claude, I'm just thinking, oh, my gosh, that's probably why I didn't learn learn that. So, well, well. <laughs> you know, again, Laura, you, you raised su- su- such a good point. And, and I want to and I, I'm so glad you brought it up, both of you, because there's this big debate that goes on in EL, EB, ML circles about a deficit perspective and an assets perspective as if as if they're contradictory. You know, I mean, as both of you said, these kids know stuff. They're not blank slates. Right. I mean, no, not even a newborn is a blank slate. I mean, we, we know from neo, neonatal studies that kids have some understanding. It's rudimentary. Right. There's a lot more to learn in the next few years. but human beings aren't born blank slates. And certainly five, six, seven-year-olds, English learners are not b- blank slates. They have assets. They know stuff. They've had experiences. But at the same time, they have instructional needs like all students do. That's why we have this thing called education. <laughs> and the idea that there's this dichotomy between an assets-based approach and a, and a, and a deficit-based approach just kind of makes me crazy because it's like, like so many dichotomies in education and in life, you know, without getting too far afield. It's it's dysfunctional. I mean it's completely dysfunctional to say you're you know you're you're being asked you you need to keep in mind both. I mean one of the truisms of an education is that you build on strengths, which means you first have to identify them, Lori, as you said. You build on strengths and you identify instructional needs. What what needs to happen next? Now it's easier said than done, but that that's a truism among among we teachers. Right, build on strengths, mm-hmm. identify and address instructional needs. Yeah, Claude, I'm going to throw a question out there. We didn't discuss this in the pre-call, but um, <laughs> it's just you're, yeah, it's just making me think of it. This conversation that when we are building on strengths, so much of that means that explicit, that systematic instruction which aligns to reading science, and we know that a critical part of that is building knowledge and students having access to uh, knowledge about the world around them through texts and all, you know, all types of texts. Um, so I'm wondering if you might be able to speak to maybe um, an English learner specialist or a teacher listening and, and think about their lens right now. Like, What would you say to them in terms of teaching our students and, and building their knowledge? Like what would what would it look like for students in the classroom with them? Right. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. Well, sort of let me answer that first of all, kind of generally, and then maybe we can get into specifics. Generally speaking, um and we're and I'm assuming we're talking about early literacy, but even ongoing literacy development. Um those the foundational skills, um beginning with phonological awareness and moving all the way up to fluency, which is, uh, which is always an issue because you, you don't just get fluent and then you stay fluent because the, the, the challenges of what you're reading increase exponentially. And you can be a fluent reader when you're like in second grade, but if you don't sort of keep up your fluency skills, you're not going to be fluent in seventh, eighth, and ninth grade when the texts get longer and the words get harder and the concepts get more challenging. So fluency is a potential issue all along the line. And unless you're really fluent with processing, you know, Mark Seidenberg calls this a language of the speed of sight. If you're not really automatic and fluent with um, the language coming in through your eyes, uh, you're going to have trouble with comprehension and all sorts of other things. So that needs to be attended to all the time. But at the same time, that knowledge building, that vocabulary development that can be done through the oral channel, right? Because even though you're learning and developing a second language, it, it, it's, it's, more, it's, it's just easier to process things orally. Now, this is a generalization, sure. and not everyone would agree. Because some people, I've heard people say, "Well, I'm a visual learner, so I learn better by reading." So there are all sorts of individual variations, right? And I, and I don't want to ignore those. But you've got to keep a focus as you're working on those reading skills. 
you've got to keep a focus on vocabulary and background knowledge, specifically background knowledge to help you understand what you're reading, but also more general uh, world knowledge. I mean, that, that's extremely important, whether it improves your reading comprehension or not. Knowing about the world is like super important. So you need to keep a focus on that. So reading development. Now, as reading development proceeds, it becomes increasingly dependent on vocabulary knowledge and background knowledge that's related to what you're reading. So if you don't work on those things, reading development is, is going to be truncated. Right? There's going to be a, a sort of a, a low ceiling because you can be reading words you don't understand and reading about concepts about which you don't have the background knowledge to understand. So it's absolutely essential that you work on those things as you're working on those reading skills. Now, it's a t- I mean, it's very easy for me to sit here and hear, hear the things you have to do, <laughs> but there are time constraints, right? I mean, time is probably the most valuable resource we have as teachers. And the one that's the scarcest, you know, there's a whole political economy of teaching and learning because that is a scarce resource, time. Yeah. And how do you shoehorn in the things that got to be got to be done? And it's one of the many reasons I think it's important to be efficient in our teaching. And it's one of the many reasons I think, I don't know if people are going to like it when I say this, but 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 efficient, systematic, explicit, well-organized instruction is really important because you got to address a lot of issues in a very scant amount of time. And if we spend a lot of time teaching, say, three queuing, for example, just to choose an obvious one, that is not going to be beneficial, certainly not going to be efficient. Some kids will get it. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Some kids learn to read using three queuing. I mean, I have I know people who learn to read in the whole language classroom, and just like the whole language people say, one day they woke up and boom, I can read. Well, those are not as common as you might think, and certainly not common for kids who come from homes and environments where there's not a whole lot of literacy. So we have to be more efficient. We have to use our time smartly and efficiently because the agenda is so large. And for English learners, it's particularly large because Again, they're learning these skills as they're learning to understand and speak the language in which those skills are being taught. Now, the situation is a little bit different when you're in a bilingual education situation because obvious reasons, you don't have to worry about whether they know the language that they're learning to read. But they do have to learn English, and that, that's another big-time issue. So we've got to look for ways that are efficient and effective, and maybe we can put put some of our ideological, sometimes sort of aesthetic differences aside, and think about what's the most efficient way to go about this, because there's just no time to to waste. I mean, it's that simple and complex. Well, I feel like I could um, (laughs) ask you a million more questions, and it is almost an hour, so we won't ask you a million more questions. Um, But I will ask one more, which is just, what else do you think that people need to understand about the science of reading movement or teaching English learners to read or anything else that you think is important to share? Well, I appreciate this last pass at a soapbox, um, (laughs) and I'll I'll, I'll keep it brief. But uh, as you might have guessed from, so my comments, I, I, I think it's incredibly important that people who are leaders in the field, um, academics, advocates, um, uh, politicians, whoever, I mean, people who speak for English learners and advocate for them, it's incredibly important that they be up to date on the research, that they understand what's in the research, what the best knowledge is. Uh, I find it just, just. I don't even use, know what word to use, that so many English learner advocates just don't know some of these studies, don't know the neurolinguistic research, don't know the studies that Sharon Vaughan and Linnea Airy have done that converge with the kind of general science of reading things, but also make clear that some additional components are needed. And there's, and on the other side, a lot of the science of reading folks don't really understand the, a lot of the bilingual education research. I mean, I will say that when I talk to the, quote, science of reading folks, they are much more receptive 
to learning about the bilingual education research and, and that whole agenda with bilingual education, they're much more receptive to that than I find that a lot of my English learner colleagues are to finding out and considering research from the, quote, science of reading that they don't know and don't appreciate. So there's this kind of strange imbalance there, which I can't quite figure out, not even going to begin to you know try to speculate about. But I think we all have an obligation, all meaning those of us who are on podcasts and webinars and writing and, and get invited to do talks and influence teachers and politicians and policymakers, to be up with the research and, and to be transparent about what we know, what we don't know, where the holes in our understanding are, and what research might exist that might help fill those roles, even if not definitively, because questions are never answered definitively. But I think we have a tremendous obligation to the field uh, to be comprehensive in our understanding of what the best research suggests is are the best ways to go about helping our kids achieve high levels of literacy and high levels of academic achievement. So that would be the note I would like to end on. Thank you for that opportunity. Well, we can't thank you enough for sharing all of this amazing information with us today and, and with our listeners. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening, literacy lovers. To stay connected with us, sign up for our email list at literacypodcast.com. And to keep learning together, join the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast Facebook group and be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If this episode resonated with you, take a moment to share with a teacher friend or leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Just a quick reminder that the views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast are not necessarily the opinions of Great Minds PBC or its employees. We appreciate you so much, and we're so glad you're here to learn with us.